SPIE presents the Advancing the Laser series, honoring 50 years of laser achievements. Hi, I'm Bob McCrory. I'm director now at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics and Vice Provost here at the University of Rochester. And I've spent my entire career in uh, inertial confinement fusion research using large lasers. I began the quest after graduate school where I went to Los Alamos where they had an interesting inertial fusion program involving uh, carbon dioxide lasers. I wasn't there too long before I realized that uh, the longer wavelength associated with CO2 was not well suited to what we wanted to do in inertial confinement fusion. And I was highly attracted by a small program at the University of Rochester, which wasn't nearly as well funded as the big programs at the National Lab, but was making some remarkable progress. And so I came here uh, expecting to be here for a few years, and uh, I guess I couldn't find another job because I've been here ever since uh, and became its director in uh, 1983. This facility, I think, is probably DOE's go-to place for users to have access to high energy density facilities because we don't conduct classified research. We're much more open than the national security labs. Uh, secondly, with the revolution in laboratory astrophysics of these places, this is the place to go. This lab has produced 191 PhDs uh, since it was founded in 1970. Our users program has brought users from other universities here to do experiments, and they've produced well over 80 PhDs. So we're kind of the national go-to place. I think you're going to see this place is like a real magnet for industry for other universities. And of course, people that do well here and have a really big scaled experiment they want to move up to, they'll be in a good position to go from here to the National Ignition Facility and test those ideas out. One of the questions people ask, including Secretary Chu when he visited uh, NIF or people when they visit this facility, is why is it so big? You know, and the answer is in uh, it has to do with optical coating and damage thresholds. Okay, basically, uh, if you could increase the uh, damage threshold of the optics used for the laser beams a factor of ten, the aperture would be, you know, a factor of three smaller in diameter. So that's really what sets the size of these systems. All big lasers run as close as they can to breaking. Okay, other, because expense kind of goes as the size of the aperture cubed, uh, you know, and uh, but that's also goodness in terms of how benign it is to uh, the coatings. So we've seen incredible development of coating uh, technology for high uh, peak power lasers that uh, was unheard of uh, 30 years ago when people had the idea of laser fusion. The Omega laser system is basically the size of a football field. It sits in a room about 240 feet long and about 90 feet uh, wide and about 20 feet high. Okay, uh, It's comprised of 60 beams, each of which the, the, the largest aperture that we use is 15 centimeters and that's up telescope before transporting to the target chamber. The Omega EP uh, laser uses NIF technology, so that is a beam that is square and 40 centimeters on a side. And each of the Omega EP beams is capable of producing over 10 kilojoules in the infrared, uh, or about five, uh, seven kilojoules in the ultraviolet, or about five kilojoules in extremely short pulses when we want to use the petawatt capability of it. You know, why did we lose so much energy? Because it's the damage threshold of the compression gratings that becomes the fuse in that system. The ability to generate extremely short pulses has found all kinds of applications, in, especially for smaller lasers. In chemistry, it's been uh, the enabling technology for a couple of Nobel Prizes. Uh, for example, the ability to do uh, very precision pulse shaping uh, has been very, very important in a number of, of applications. Very short pulse lasers have also been uh, used for machining. You can even uh, machine high explosives with lasers because if the pulse is short enough, you don't put enough energy in to designate to detonate the high explosives. And if it's short, it doesn't form a plasma 
uh, so you can do it with very, very high precision. What I expect in the next few years is, you know, ignition is going to work on the National Ignition Facility. Uh, there has been a uh, groundswell of interest in high energy density physics, laboratory astrophysics. There are a number of uh, History Channel and Discovery Channel uh, documentaries about this stuff that's just incredibly exciting because anytime you can put matter under extreme conditions, you're going to learn something. Okay, and this is, it's, uh, these lasers give us the capability to go places that we've never been before. There are new advanced concepts for ignition that are even more energy efficient than the so-called hotspot ignition that we're pursuing first. Uh, fast ignition is one of them where you use some of these very high peak power short pulse lasers to basically ignite a, an isochorically assembled core that gives you a gain of about a factor of five over the conventional approach. Once we get ignition and burn, you know, there's just going to be great uses for these neutrons. So I think you're going to see an energy revolution where the joke about fusion has been it's an energy uh, source of the future and it always will be. Yeah, and I think that's going to change when people say, yes, we have it in the laboratory now. It's not an imagine what, it's imagine when.